first of all, uh, thank you to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Um, I'm going to be talking about cryoablation. And, uh, so, uh, first thing I'd like to say is uh, cryoablation is easy. So, if you are doing ultrasound and guided nerve blocks, if you are doing uh, radio frequency procedures, then there is not much you have to learn. So, it's for everyone. So, uh, I paid for my own flights and uh, everything else, so there's no conflict of interest and uh, I have nothing to gain. The company is, there's only one company which is uh, promoting or giving uh, cryo products in uh, India and I have uh, no association of any kind with them. So, um, so why, I mean, like, I've just listed some of the common things which I'm asked about and uh, cryo, uh, ablation or cryosurgery or cryoanesthesia or cryoneurolysis. These are different terms which have been used from time to time. But the most common things I'm asked about is uh, where I use it or how do I use it? What type of pain do I use it in? What has changed? Why do I need to talk about it now? After all, it's been there since, you know, donkey's years. 1976, the term was coined and ice has been used in different forms before that as well. And then the other common thing which I ask, get asked about is where do we use cryo and where do we use cooled. I think from the beginners it's quite uh, you know, uh, uh, confusing because the term cooled radio frequency is, uh, needs to be differentiated from cryoablation. So cryoablation is using the cold to uh, do the treatment whereas cooled radio frequency is using the heat or the burn but we use the term cooled because the tip of the needle is cooled with a liquid uh, kind of flowing through the needle. So they are different, they are actually totally opposite. Cooled radio frequency is using heat, whereas, or, or radio frequency, uh, if I was to be more precise, whereas the cryoablation is using the cold or the temperature with the Jules Thompson effect. So they are actually uh, opposite treatments. Then I do uh, get asked about the evidence uh, and I thought the best way to answer all these questions was probably to give a few examples where I've used this treatment. And I let the audience judge as themselves as what other modes could have been used instead or, and, and to get an idea of where it fits in. So uh, just uh, before I go on to all of those things, I think it's relevant to talk about the evidence a little bit. So uh, this, uh, these are two images which I took from the same phone, on the same flight, just a few seconds apart. And there is a huge difference. And I put these out there because I was thinking about evidence when I took these pictures. And I, and I, and I thought, it varies so much. The only thing which has changed is, one picture has been taken from one side of the plane and the other one's been taken on the other side of the plane. So, so I mean, like, what I want to say is, the evidence depends on a lot of things. And, and the reality, both of them are reality, but it also depends on how you view the reality, where you're viewing it from, uh, and, and that's important to understand. So, yes. so <laughs> what I like about uh, uh, anesthetists and pain specialists is we don't give up so easily. When other modalities have given up, uh, people say there's nothing else to offer, often that's where we will come out with a clever idea, think out of the box, and, and give a solution. And, and in this journey, long, um, I'm like long, long, long time ago, we did realize that nerves are our friends. So that's where we focus our treatments on often. This is the part which is often overlooked by other people. You know, they're just trying to fix the actual mechanical problem and not focusing so much on how we can deal with the processing of pain, whether that be at a peripheral level or a spinal level or maybe even at the brain level. So that's where. Uh, Cryoablation fits in as well. So I'll just uh, go through a few case stories or examples and that will help you put things into perspective. So the first one I'm going to be talking about is a 19 year old male. And it seems like a very small pitch problem on that picture. If somebody's got a uh, basically an ingrowing um, nail on this ring finger and he's only 19 years old and he came to me and he said, these are his exact words. I stopped counting after 250 injections and 10 surgeries. I've had many more after that. And I want some relief so that I can pursue with my educational uh, life and other life uh, you know, without having this problem. And I don't mind if somebody chops this finger off, but I just want to be off, you know, off, 
get rid of the pain. So it started as an ingoing nail and then with the complex surgeries and so many injections, by the time we landed in my clinic, it was very tricky to assess and put a label to his pain. Most, of, most likely it is a mixed kind of a pain with a neuropathic and a uh, MSK component in there as well. And the most effective treatment for him was ring blocks. Uh, which used to give him a short term of a short time of relief and i think that explains the 250 injections he has had and um, it was interfering with his education and he had he was a very genuine and realistic guy who wanted all he wanted was my pain reduces to a tolerable level he wasn't asking for a, a magic cure where there is no pain and he said i'm like i just want the pain to reduce the interference in my life if the finger can move after that i'm very happy if it doesn't move i don't care but just let me get on with my life. So anyways, so um, that's why we started thinking out of the box. Uh, so I said, okay, there are four digital nerves which are supplying this part of his finger. Let's do sequential block of each of them and see what happens with that. So we used 0.3 ml at each of the locations with a basic ultrasound machine. I w I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, most of us have done ring blocks, but I've not gone ahead and looked at individual digital nerves and uh, you know, how I can use them to my advantage. So we, uh, the yellow uh, arrows are pointing to the digital nerves and you can see uh, in the web space, uh, in that area you can see the nerve dividing in, into two different branches. One would go along this finger, the other one along this finger. So I could see these uh, digital nerves and I blocked them on the palmar aspect and the dorsal aspect, both of them I could see. And what we did was we went ahead and blocked these nerves to identify that the main, and after every block, these were done sequentially at the same sitting, I would see how his pain score changes, right? So we started with eight or nine, went to four or five. So that way I could identify which are the uh, most um, pain carrying nerves and we identified two of them. And then, uh, then we proceeded after that to do the cryoablation. And this is, these are some pictures where we're doing the procedure. This is post procedure. You can see the scar marks where the uh, one. So one one nerve we did cry on was on the uh, palmar aspect, another one on the dorsal aspect. We just did two out of the four, and then post procedure he had good relief with significant uh, reduction in pain levels. And this is his him moving his finger, uh, and these this this was persistent. And to actually uh, uh, be honest about it, you can see on the dorsal side there was a scar mark. And that was the frostbite or the cryoablation because the probe uh, froze skin up to the skin. That scar mark took, if I play that video again, video again, you can see. That scar mark took, you can see that scar over there. That took about, about two to three weeks to heal because it was a very superficial nerve. But then at the end of it, he was a happy person. So the second one, so I'm moving to a different type of pain. Cancer pain, 68 year old, sudden presentation of uh, severe pain to the hospital. And then he had other comorbidities. He's had a, a CVA, he'd had a recent one, to be honest, and he'd uh, got end stage renal pain failure. And uh, when his abdominal pain was investigated during the inpatient admission, they found a lung mass, and that was invading the intercostal nerves. And when they did a PET scan and they found the prognosis was pretty grim, it's all spread around. And um, he took the news relatively well, I would say. And the family was very realistic and all they wanted was the last few months of his life to be very comfortable. So we went ahead and did a uh, cryo for him. And I've also chosen this case to highlight that, uh, you know, the advantage, one of the advantages of cryo was uh, immediate relief. So in certain situations, we want immediate relief. This is what cryo gives me, and I'm very happy about that. So this one was picked up by the papers as well, and, and um, I'm like, uh, it was well received. I'm sorry, this, this changes are happening because of the formatting uh, from one format, Microsoft PowerPoint, to the other one. But anyways, coming back to it. So this one uh, is a different type of a case, uh, acute pain example. Uh, a 61 year old who had a severe RTA was transferred to my hospital in Delhi and uh, he had multiple injuries, multiple rib fractures. Um, initial few weeks they tried to wean him multiple times off the ventilator and they could not. Uh, and 
then they realize, oh, it's the pain which is stopping him from weaning off the ventilator. And so they made a plan where they decided to fix the fractures surgically, but there were so many of them. And the surgeon uh, then at that stage got us involved as well because they were looking for a long-term solution to his pain or a reasonably long-term solution to his pain so that you know uh, he can be weaned off after the surgery um, from the ventilator. So this uh, picture, actually the link, is actually a video uh, which is his feedback and it's worth watching uh, on YouTube. So uh, we did it as a combined procedure with the surgeon. So the surgeon fixed his ribs. Uh, before that, we uh, did cryoablation of multiple nerves and post-surgery, two days off, he was off the ventilator. Stayed another five days in the hospital and the next week he was back home. So I'm just showing you different scenarios, different scenarios where it can fit in. So we've talked about acute pain, mixed pain, chronic pain. Then this is another one, herpes <coughs> zoster. In a, in, a, in a patient with chronic renal failure who could not tolerate even smallest doses of neuropathics, he was hallucinating with them. We went and froze the intercostal nerves and, and he was happy after that. Another one, a young, young lady, very active physically, just a minor trauma to the knee and she damaged the infrapatella saphenous nerve. Uh, yes, the diagnosis was a, was a struggle. She had to keep circling around to different specialities, to different um, uh, specialists before, she, before this diagnosis was made. And we just uh, froze this small little nerve uh, and you can see it on ultrasound, I'm sure. Uh, for anyone who's tried, uh, they would understand what I mean. So that's the nerve splitting over there just loop again and I'll show it to you again. So there, that's the nerve splitting into two and you can see the two branches going in different directions and you can freeze this easily. So not only can you see the nerve but also its branches. Another example, MSK, severe bilateral shoulder pain. She had COVID uh, and other comorbidities, noticeably Parkinsonism and then because of the comorbidities, she was literally bedridden or bedbound is the proper word. And because of the shoulder pain, she could not lie on either of her sides. So she was admitted to the hospital because she developed bed sores and they needed debridement. But the surgeon wanted us to give her relief so that she can lie on her sides and nurse so that the bed sores get an opportunity to heal. And when I asked the patient, what do you want? How, what are your expectations? She said, my biggest challenge is drinking my tea in the morning. And I really love to do that. So if I can have raise my hand enough to eat my food or drink my tea, I'm very happy with that. So very realistic expectations again. So she underwent a combined procedure. The bed sores were debrided and I did cryoablation of the articular branches of the nerves on, on both her shoulders. So this is a procedure being done in the theater. Normally this doesn't need theatre, but this is a procedure being done. And you'd be surprised, post-surgery the next day when I went to see her, she did this to me. You know, I should have clicked a picture, but I didn't. Uh, but that's the amazing thing. One, because in this situation, we wanted immediate relief. She's had a debridement. We want her to be able to lie on her sides. Um, and, and that would help the healing process. So there we go. So shoulder pain. Relief was a secondary gain, which was uh, there as well. But that's the aim, that's what the aim was. So indications, nerve problems, sensory nerves, or where the motor loss is acceptable, acute pain, MSK pain, mixed pain, cancer pain. We've covered all these examples <coughs> in these scenarios. So there, 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 that is where it fits in. Now some of these scenarios, you may have uh, offered an RF as well, uh, like in the shoulder pain case. Uh, but then I have obvious advantages of using cryotherapy situations like the immediate relief, you know, and that's what makes it different. So, um, as I said, it's been there for a long time. We use a compressed gas which expands through a small opening and the aim is to get the tip really cold and that <coughs> temperatures we achieve in that area are up to minus 80 degrees which freezes the nerves and stops them from working and that's how we get the pain relief. The advantage is that we don't destroy the myelin sheath or the outer coating 
and that's why there is no neuroma formation and that's why I'm not worried about using this. So you actually what you're doing is having a controlled lesion of the nerve where there is the outer coating which is preserved which then the nerve regenerates in, in, in a few months time uh, and that's the whole idea. The destruction which happens is because of the temperature so there is one injury which is caused by the uh, by the freezing temperatures then there is the cold which causes the injury so there will be different zones in one zone you've got the freezing temperatures and then the outside zones may be not so freezing but uh, still cold enough to cause injury and then there are delayed effects because of the vascular changes which occur this is how the uh, machine looks like. We've shown that in the demo yesterday for all of those who attended the demo. And all you need is one syringe of local anesthetic, uh, introducer of some kind, which I, which the easiest available one, which I use is a 14 gauge cannula. Then you need some probe covers and a gas source and the machine and the imaging modality you're going to use to guide your needle. This is uh, just to show how it works. So I'm just gonna, uh, you can see actually the uh, the ice uh, wall or the crystal being formed over there. And this is also visible in ultrasound. As it expands and forms, you can actually see the imaging changing. So uh, advantages, uh, number one, no neuroma formation. Uh, number two, you get immediate relief. These are the two things, and I'm I can use it on multiple locations where I am not happy using RF um, because we know pulsed RF, depending on what you're looking at, can do the needful or may not do the needful. Radio frequency ablation, which is burning, you don't want to do it for all nerves, and this is where it comes in in between. Then there are situations like pacemakers and stimulators and all those kind of things. Uh, where this is offers you an extra advantage. But yes, it's not all good. There are limitations. So if I'm doing a knee RF, I would choose cool RF because that has the maximum potential of giving me relief, maybe up to a year, maybe up to one and a half years. Whereas this one, you would expect a shorter duration of relief, six months, maybe a little more, maybe 12, maybe 12 months at the most if you're very lucky. But yes, there are advantages as well. Like if you're treating a neuroma, when the nerve grows back, it might grow back as a normal nerve as well. So in that case, it can be permanent. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much. Uh, if anyone's interested in coming and seeing whenever we're doing the procedure, just drop me an email. Uh, we, we, uh, we're not, I'm like, we don't have any worries in having visitors as long as the patient allows uh, that. And, and we're happy to share what we're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mo for creating such a new insight about the cryo evolution and uh, discussing the coming from <laughs> and discussing different scenarios where uh, cryo ablation can be applied thank you so much uh, any questions sorry I, I feel a little guilty from uh, moving from evidence based medicine to experience based medicine but this uh, particular uh, scenario what we're talking about it's changed so rapidly in the last few years. We've got new understanding of the anatomy of the nerves we never looked for. We've got latest MSK ultrasound machines which help us visualize these structures. So I think the evidence will follow. But uh, uh, there is evidence which, which can be viewed whichever way you want. Uh, but I think we will have more to see in this field in the coming years. Questions, please.